We got a great guest standing by. It's the Atlantic's Derek Thompson. Let's get to it. Yeah. Can I put in a word about the history of advertising as yes, revealed in yeah. Moves Attention Merchants? Go ahead. I love yeah. that book. And my favorite anecdote from that book is that um, the concept of advertising supported media was invented in the United States by Benjamin Day, who was the founder of the New York Sun. Right. And Benjamin Day is the father of the penny paper, right? So before the penny paper, I guess papers cost like six cents, which was a lot in the 1820s. And he said, no, 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 what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna price the paper below what it actually costs. I'm gonna sell it at a loss, but then I'm gonna sell the audience that I've captured at a loss as its own product to advertisers. So he creates this sort of dual business model where you get both subscription revenue, the pennies that you pay for the papers and the advertisement. Within one year, he was running a nine part, 16,000 word series on men on the moon. So it took about 300 days between the invention of advertising in American media and the invention of fake news in wow. American media, which goes Incredible. to show <laughs> that once your job is to essentially just sell audience as a product, you're not beholden to any sort of no. truth. You're there only you beholden to the North Star of maximizing audience. And fiction outsells nonfiction everywhere. It outsells nonfiction in it cinema. Does. It outsells yeah. nonfiction in books. Fiction outsells nonfiction. And so the minute that you introduce this business model, you introduce this tendency, uh, uh, this, this tantalizing tendency um, to become uh, a, a fake news proprietor. Well, and let's keep going on that theme because what happened then is a lot of what those advertisements were were for what was called this patent medicine, right. which was just pure snake oil quackery. And yet there were no there was no like exposing of this industry because mm -hmm. the news media is in bed with them, depends on them for advertising revenue. So it takes years and years for that entire corrupt industry to ultimately be exposed. So you can see directly like the corrupting influence of when you're taking money from actors who may be bad actors, the way that it impacts your coverage, you may not lie about it, but you're just not gonna talk about it. Yeah, in, in a way, that's actually, it's interesting that you put it like that. What you're doing is lying to your readers so that you can sell them to advertisers mm -hmm. who will lie to your readers, right? It is like this sort of double sandwich, this like, you know, club yep. sandwich of lies that you're selling to your audience. The news is fiction in order to s show them advertising that is also fiction. And Derek, you know, speaking of the news media and how people influ are influenced and all that, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on, given, you know, what's going on right now with the pandemic, you wrote this great piece back in February. We talked to you about it on Rising. Let's put it up there on the screen around what it exactly works to come Combating vaccine refusal. So that was February. And I was curious, now it's July 26, been almost four months, five months or whatever since you wrote that piece. What are your thoughts about where we're at right now with Delta around vaccine hesitancy? We've got like 49% of the US adults who uh, have not taken the vaccine. Where, What tactics do you think will work, so to speak, in terms of getting more people vaccinated, both from the government, the media, and more? I think it's really important when talking about what works to get people who have been on the sidelines off the sidelines is to recognize that the population of people who have not yet gotten a vaccine or from the perspective of February had not yet gotten a vaccine is not just one group. It's really best thought of as a, a constellation of groups. One of those sort of stars in the constellation is the anti-vax group. These are people who think that the vaccines are a conspiracy, and that can range from like, you know, it's got the microchips from Bill Gates to I just don't trust Big Pharma, and there's no way in hell that I'm going to put this in my body. That's a pretty hard no. I'll bet you can nibble around the corners of that no, but you're not going to convert 100% of the absolute anti-vaxxers. And they're about 15% of the adult population, 15, 16%. It's going to be really, really difficult to get them. But they're not the entire group. You also have what's sometimes called the wait and see group. This is a Kaiser, uh, when they do their really gold standard of a, of mm -hmm. a poll of the Novax population, they call this the wait and see. And it's the wait and see where you've really seen progress. I think you've seen progress among the wait and see category for two reasons. Number one, they have waited and they have seen that the vaccines work, right? <laughs> they don't just work in the US. They don't just work in states that are high vaccinated. They work in the UK. Look at the difference between cases and deaths in the UK dealing with the B117 variant. Look at Israel where deaths 
per day have fallen to one, two, I think, on a seven-day average. The mm -hmm. vaccines clearly work, not just in the clinical trials, but in the real-world trials that we are all participants in. The other reason why I think the wait-and-see group has nudged a little bit more toward the vaccines isn't just that they have seen that the vaccines work, but they've started to feel pressure around the cost-benefit analysis that they're doing about these vaccines. So on the cost side, the cost of not getting a vaccine is higher in the face of a variant like Delta, right? Right. So all the news that we're seeing about Delta might be getting people to move off the sidelines. And then the benefit side, you know, I think you have a lot of media that has consistently and truthfully extolled the benefits of these vaccines, which don't just make it less likely you get infected, but contingent on getting infected, make it less likely that you get severe illness, and then contingent upon getting a severe illness, make it less likely that you die. Yeah. So. On the cost and benefit side, I think that's worked really well too. And I think that you know we need to just keep up the conversation. The last thing that I think we should really think seriously about doing, and this is starting to become really a, a theme in, in, um, in the media that I consume at least, is we have to move the FDA's ruling here from emergency authorization to full approval. That's mm. not only gonna send a really strong signal that the government believes in these vaccines as much as they say they believe in the vaccines, but also it's going to allow uh, state and local governments to mandate vaccines for, say, teachers and cops. Mm. Why do you think, Derek, that we have so many more vaccine-hesitant people here than in most other developed countries around the world? I saw a stat that, like, only Russia has more <laughs> vaccine-hesitant people. And, you know, my own speculation for what it's worth is, number one, there's sort of just, like, something deep, deeply embedded in American culture that creates this, like, climate of skepticism um, towards any sort of institution. But, you know, we had Michael Brendan Doherty on from the National Review, conservative dude, and mm -hmm. he surprised me by effectively making a case for universal health care. He was like, I think that part of why they have better uptake in the UK is because they've got the National Health Service. And so it's not a profit-driven thing. People have primary care phys physicians. Everybody is sort of in touch and contact in some way with the medical system. Do you think that there's something to that? I think there's absolutely something to that. I would twin Michael's explanation with your previous explanation and say that they are both downstream of the same phenomenon, which is to sort of slap a term on it, Reaganite individualism. Hmm. Yeah. So like Reaganite conservative neo-libertarian individualism says a couple of things. It says, number one, you're all on your own. So you should think all on your own. You shouldn't trust experts. You should do your own research. There's some truth to that. I love the idea of people thinking for themselves, but if you take too much of that medicine, you start thinking that anyone who represents as an expert is wrong by dint of their expertise, which is effing stupid. Mm -hmm. What also happens that is downstream of Reaganite libertarianism, conservatism, whatever I'm naming it, individualism, is that there's fear of government takeover. And because there's fear of government takeover of any industry, you don't have nationalized healthcare service. And because you don't have nationalized healthcare service, you have more people who live in precarity. And more people who live in precarity, nervous about a new vaccine treatment, might be less likely to want to experiment with that treatment, less likely to want to take time off of work, afraid they might get sick and don't have healthcare if they have you know, a strong reaction to the Pfizer or Moderna drug. So I think that both explanations are true, and they are rivers downstream of the large tributary of Reaganite individualism, which is endemic in this country. I want to get back to something you said about FDA. Uh, I, had heard, I, I imagine there's going to be some pushback. We have some people who are vaccine hesitant who listen or who watch the show. And what they would say is, Derek, are you saying put political pressure on the FDA in order to incentivize people get vaccinated? Just go into why it might send a good message and if it does meet the requirements. Like, is the FDA being too cautious? What do you think about all that? Well, of course it should meet the requirements. Of, of, of course the FDA should approve a drug if it meets, a, or a treatment in this case, not a drug, me, approve a treatment that meets the requirements of an approved treatment, absolutely. At the same time, I think that there's a bit of a mixed message when every institution in America is telling people that these vaccines work extremely well, except for the FDA, which mm -hmm. is saying they are approved, they are authorized and not approved only for emergency use. That's the EUA, emergency use authorization. I think that sends two messages to people. The first message that it sends is that it's only authorized in an emergency. 
And there's a lot of Americans who in the last 16 months, 18 months, whatever it's been since the pandemic started, say this pandemic was never an emergency for me. I basically lived my normal life. So why should I take something that's only authorized right. in a scenario that I don't actually buy into? And second, I just think it makes it sound like there are still questions about this vaccine. And from what like we've never seen a real world trial of a treatment that has basically been administered hundreds of millions of times in vastly diverse countries. The, I mean, all over the world, you see uh, uh, these mRNA vaccines being administered and immediately you see deaths plummet to less than one in one million. The vaccines very clearly are doing their job at ending the pandemic by the definition of bringing deaths per million under one in one million. And so I think that it's, it's I am eager for, I am anticipatory for the FDA to uh, uh, approve the vaccines officially mm. because I know it's going to happen. We all know it's going to happen. And I think that it would accelerate back vaccination uptake now if it happened sooner rather than later. Yeah. So the number that I've seen is that 68.8% or somewhere thereabouts of adults have had, ha have had at least one dose of a vaccine. And we know that having at least one dose does provide you with significant protection. So what do we know about where herd immunity actually lies? Like, what's the number we need to hit? Yeah, the reason that's such a difficult number to give is that the virus does not care about the national number. The virus only cares about what's around the virus, right? The mm -hmm. virus, if, if, if I'm not vaccinated and my wife is sitting here and she's not vaccinated, the fact that 70% of Americans outside of this house are vaccinated has no interest to the virus passing between two unvaccinated people. So that's why you have a lot of people talking right now about a pandemic of the unvaccinated mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons, including Bill Bishop's theory of the big sort, Democrats tend to live around Democrats and Republicans tend to live around Republicans. We've sorted by political ideology. Now, political ideology isn't the single variable that explains vaccine uptake, but it might be the best variable that correlates with vaccine uptake. So if you if you have a lot of, let's call them liberals and yes vaxxers who are living together, they're going to be very protected in their vaccinated bubble. And then you're going to have a lot of Republicans who are more likely to be no vaxxers, especially if they're under the age of 65, and they're living in an unvax bubble. And so what's happening right now is that you have a lot of virus, a lot of Delta variant that is spreading among, among the unvaxed bubbles and not among the vax bubbles. That also goes to explain why a disproportionate share of the hospitalized and the dead in this country uh, are, are unvax rather than vax. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, so to your point, there's no such thing as herd immunity nationally when we're so divided by ideology and by propensity to take this vaccine. Another area where division comes back to bite us. Derek, really appreciate um, all your analysis here, man. Such a smart guy. I know you're on book leave. We're all really excited. You hope that you stop by uh, on your book tour uh, back on the show. What's the book going to be about, Derek? Oh, the book right now is about um, the most exciting ideas in science and tech uh, and how they can help us uh, uh, save the world. Basically, God. looking toward a future of tech we can be positive about rather than uh, technology that makes us miserable as we stare into our phones. <laughs> that sounds something optimistic. so hopeful. Yeah, <laughs> something <laughs> optimistic. Something that we need more of um, on the show in our politics. Appreciate you joining us, man. Great Thank to you. see you, Derek. Thank you, guys. Absolutely. All right, everybody, thank you so much for watching. You can become a premium subscriber today at the link down in there in the description notes. You get the show an hour early, all of that. Also, don't let anybody say we don't listen. You notice these beautiful little bricks um, behind us? We got some brand new bricks. Um, I saved it to the end because I want there to be a little bit of speculation out there. <laughs> did they change it? Did they not? Yes, we certainly did. We heard you, and we've got some really fun improvements that are coming here in the studio, and we appreciate um, all of you, and we'll see you all t on Tuesday. So, so thank you. I have to say, initially, I really mm -hmm. preferred the old Brooks, mm -hmm. but by the end of the show now, I do actually, they've grown on me. Uh -huh. I do like it better. Yeah, so see. thanks for the Bristol's, feedback. Bristol's uh, less resistant, or more resistant to change, uh, but I just it's good. I thought the other ones look good. I, yeah, I think listen, they both look good. We do listen yeah. to you guys, yeah. so thank you. I do, think, I do think it just has like a little bit of a cleaner look, especially mm -hmm. when it's on either you or me directly. So. Correct. Anyway, we love you guys. Have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow.
Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. That's right. Just as a reminder, you can become a premium subscriber today. Watch the full show completely uncut. Our reactions to each other's monologues. You get to listen to it. You get to ask us questions. All that good stuff. Link is right there in the description or at breakingpoints.com. Best of all, great way to say screw you to the mainstream media.